Hello, and welcome to another session of the world's 100 greatest books from IntelliQuest. In this session, we'll discuss Henry Fielding and his great novel, Tom Jones. In many ways, much of this collection would not have been possible if it hadn't been for the work of Henry Fielding. Fielding is widely credited with being the father of the novel as a prominent literary form. And his novel, Tom Jones, published in 1749, is considered one of the finest works of any kind in Fielding's time. In the next few minutes, you'll be introduced to Fielding and the times in which he wrote. Then you'll become acquainted with Tom Jones, Fielding's greatest work. Born in 1707, Fielding was considered a gentleman because he was related to nobility, but it was a title only because he had no inheritance. He acquired an impeccable literary education and a genuine passion for literature at a prep school named Eton, where he was exceptionally well-schooled in the classics, English literature, and continental literature. What set him apart, though, was his sense of humor and his talent to get it across in his writing. While most Eton graduates went on to Oxford or Cambridge, Fielding did not, probably because of a lack of funds. Instead, he chose to study law at the University of Leiden in Holland. However, he did not complete his law degree, again due to a lack of funds. After leaving Leiden, Fielding began writing plays for the London stage. And although he is not remembered for his stage plays, his experience in the theatre proved useful when he began to write novels. Fielding opposed Sir Robert Walpole, the English Prime Minister at the time, and some of his plays were satires directed against Walpole. In retaliation, Walpole pushed through Parliament a licensing act which made it necessary for all stage plays to be licensed before they could be produced. Fielding realized at once that he would never be able to license his plays. With a wife and two daughters to support, the licensing act put Fielding at great financial risk. While enrolled in Middle Temple, one of the ancient English law schools, he supported his family with his writing skills. He contributed essays to a magazine called The Champion, showing a depth of concern for social issues. About that time, Pamela, which is believed to be the first English novel, was published by Samuel Richardson. The tightly organized story, which featured extensive character studies and dealt with sensitive moral issues, was a huge success. It had, however, many failings on which Fielding would improve. While Fielding was a professional writer who was aware of changes in taste and the desires of the public, Richardson is described as ill-educated and humorless. Yet it was Richardson's work that inspired Fielding to become a novelist. In 1741, Fielding wrote a satire called Shamala, poking fun at Richardson's Pamela. Then he followed that in 1742 with Joseph Andrews, a thoughtful comic romance about Pamela's brother. Next he wrote Jonathan Wilde the Great, which, though supposed to be about a highwayman, was really another attack on his old political foe, Sir Robert Walpole. Fielding's health began to fail in 1742, and in 1744 both his wife and a daughter died. He was despondent, suffered from physical and emotional ills, and was short of funds. However, if Fielding was anything, he was resilient, and in 1749 he wrote Tom Jones, which met immediately with great success. Most remarkable is that Tom Jones was written at a time when Fielding was most busy, serving as a Justice of the Peace for Westminster, an extremely important section of London. It was in this position that Fielding worked hardest in his role as a social reformer. Four years after the death of his first wife, he married Mary Daniel, who had been a servant girl in his household. The marriage illustrates that Fielding, although born a gentleman, did not hold social prejudices. In 1754, Fielding died in Lisbon, Portugal. His last work was A Journal of a Voyage to Lisbon. Fielding wrote at a time that was just at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Then, most gentlemen were landholders or city dwellers, but to be considered a real gentleman, one had to spend at least part of the year in London. Thus, most landowners, who had their land worked by tenant farmers who shared in little of the wealth, had homes in London and spent considerable time participating in London's social life. Fielding's works have never lost their audience. Tom Jones was made into a movie in 1963, and Joseph Andrews reached the silver screen in 1977. Tom Jones, however, remains the finest example of Fielding's work. It is the story of an illegitimate young man who is temporarily banished by his benefactor, but eventually, after many misadventures, winds up receiving his proper inheritance and marrying the girl of his dreams. Tom's story begins in the home of Squire Allworthy, owner of one of the largest estates in Somersetshire, 
and the well-respected local magistrate. Allworthy lives alone with his plain past thirty sister Bridget. His wife had died five years earlier, and all three of his children had died in infancy. Allworthy is described by Fielding as a man who had a good heart and no family. Hence, doubtless, it will be concluded by many that he lived like an honest man, owed no one a shilling, took nothing but what was his own, kept a good house, entertained his neighbors with a hearty welcome at his table, and was charitable to the poor. When Allworthy returns from a three-month trip to London, he finds a surprise waiting for him. Fielding writes, He was preparing to step into bed when, upon opening the clothes, to his great surprise he beheld an infant, wrapped in some coarse linen, in a sweet and profound sleep between his sheets. He immediately calls Deborah Wilkins, one of his servants, to take care of the child. Mrs. Wilkins is upset. She says, If I might be so bold as to give my advice, I would have it put in a basket and sent out and laid at the church warden's door. But Allworthy does not subscribe to such drastic measures, so Mrs. Wilkins, who is described as venomous, vindictive, and two-faced, takes it upon herself to find the baby's mother, whom she calls an impudent slut, a wanton hussy, an audacious harlot, a wicked jade, a vile strumpet, and more. At last her inquiries lead to Jenny Jones, a neighborhood girl. Jenny is described as no very comely girl, either in her face or person, but nature had somewhat compensated the want of beauty with a very uncommon share of understanding. Jenny had worked as a servant for a schoolmaster and is resented in the village because of her academic accomplishments. Although there is absolutely no evidence that Jenny was the mother, she surprisingly admits to it when confronted by Mrs. Wilkins. However, she does not name the father, saying only that he is out of reach. Although Jenny could have been sent to prison for abandoning the child, Squire Allworthy is not only lenient with her, he provides funds so that she can start a new life elsewhere. Sometime thereafter, Squire Allworthy, who seems less than discriminating about who he befriends, takes in his home the villainous Dr. Bliffill. Dr. Bliffill is described by Fielding as a master of almost every other science but that by which he was to get his bread the consequence of which was the doctor at the age of forty had no bread to eat. Dr. Bliffill, who has designs on Squire Allworthy's estate, quickly wins Bridget's heart. Unfortunately for Bliffill, he is already married, and Squire Allworthy knows it. This necessitates Plan B. Bliffill's younger brother, Captain Bliffill, is invited to join the household. He has supposedly given up his military commission to study the scriptures, Less than a month later, Captain Bliffill and Bridget are married. The captain turns out to be more evil than his older brother. Fielding writes, He is enamored, that is to say, of Mr. Allworthy's house and gardens and of his lands, tenements, and hereditament, of all which the captain was so passionately fond that he would most likely have contracted marriage with them had he been obliged to have taken the Witch of Endor into the bargain. Having no intention of sharing Bridget's eventual inheritance with anyone, including his brother, the captain makes life intolerable for the doctor. It isn't long before Dr. Bliffill leaves the household and goes to London, where he dies shortly after. Eight months after marrying Captain Bliffill, Bridget bears him a son. Squire Allworthy decides to bring up his new nephew with the baby he has adopted and gives the adopted child his own Christian name, Thomas. Bridget agrees, but the fortune-hunting Captain Bliffill is outraged, fearing he'll have to share some of the wealth. Meanwhile, Mrs. Wilkins continues to search for Tom's father. Mr. Partridge, the schoolmaster for whom Jenny had worked, has a jealous, vicious wife who bitterly resents the time her husband spent educating Jenny. Mr. Partridge is described as one of the best-natured fellows in the world, and was, at the same time, master of so much pleasantry and humor that he was reputed to be the wit of the county. One day, Mrs. Partridge hears gossip that Jenny has given birth to two illegitimate children just nine months after she had left Somersetshire. Suspecting her husband, Mrs. Partridge races home in a jealous rage and beats him until he is bloody. Mrs. Wilkins hears what has happened, and, attempting to get favor with Captain Bliffill, whom she assumes will someday own the estate, tells him that Partridge is Tom Jones's father. Not wanting to share his eventual estate with anyone, Captain Bliffill tells Allworthy, who brings Partridge to trial. Although there is little evidence, Partridge is found guilty and fired from his job. Soon thereafter, his wife dies. Penniless and unemployed, Partridge is forced to leave town to earn a living. 
Tom Jones and the young Bliffville are total opposites. Tom finds getting into trouble easy, while Bliffville is, as Fielding writes, a lad of remarkable disposition, sober, discreet, and pious beyond his age. Jones's major transgression at this time is that he is caught hunting pheasants in a game preserve and charged with poaching. However, Tom refuses to reveal the identity of his companion, Squire Allworthy's gamekeeper Black George, who was not caught. He is beaten severely by the Reverend Mr. Thwackham, whose whipping fell a little bit short of the torture with which confessions are in some countries extorted from criminals. Jones's willingness to protect his friend is the first indication of Jones's fine human qualities. Incidentally, Thwackham's actions stem from the belief held by many religious leaders of that time that virtue could be beaten into sinners. Fielding holds a totally opposite view and detests this violent approach to religious compliance. Unfortunately, Tom's beating does not save Black George. After a tiff between Tom and young Blithill, Blithill calls Tom a beggarly bastard, and Tom responds by punching him in the nose, drawing blood. To get even, Blithill tells his uncle and Thwackham that Black George was with Tom during the poaching. Black George is immediately fired. When the story became public, Fielding writes, many people differed in judging the conduct of the two lads. Master Blithill was generally called a sneaking rascal, a four-spirited wretch, and other epithets of like kind, whilst Tom was honored with appellations of a brave lad, a jolly dog, and an honest fellow. Indeed, his behavior to Black George much ingratiated him with all the servants, and the friendship and gallantry of Tom Jones was celebrated by them all with the highest applause. In fact, even Bridget, Blithill's mother, prefers Tom over her deceitful son, who is condemned openly. At this point, Sophia, Squire Western's daughter, and the girl who will eventually be Tom's wife, is introduced to the story. She is eighteen and has been taught the ways of refined ladies by her aunt, who grew up in London society. Fielding describes her as a middle-sized woman, but rather inclining to tall. Her shape was not only exact, but extremely delicate, and the nice proportion of her arms promised the truest symmetry in her limbs. Her hair, which was black, was so luxuriant that it reached her middle before she cut it to comply with modern fashion, and it was now curled so gracefully in her neck that few could believe it to be her own. Her eyebrows were full, even, and arched beyond the power of art to imitate. Her black eyes had a luster in them which all her softness could not extinguish. Her cheeks were of the oval kind, and in her right she had a dimple which the least smile discovered. Sophia's external beauty was not betrayed by her personality. Writes Fielding, her mind was every way equal to her person, for when she smiled, the sweetness of her temper diffused that glory over her countenance which no regularity of features can give. Sophia has grown up with Blithill and Tom, and much prefers Tom's playful temperament to Blithill's boring disposition. It is apparent at this point in the novel that Sophia is in love with Tom. But Tom is interested in Molly Seagrim, a daughter of Black George who is considered one of the best-looking girls around. Molly is not only pretty, she is sexually active. Although Tom does not want to take advantage of her, after abstaining for three whole months, he eventually succumbs to her charms. Soon it becomes apparent that Molly is pregnant, but although her mother tries to hide it, Molly flaunts her condition at Sunday church, causing the women to be aware of her condition. After church, the women march against Molly. A melee follows, and Tom, who happens by, races to Molly's defense. By this time, she has half her clothes torn off, and Tom has to throw his coat over her and take her home. Distressed, Molly's mother says, She has brought a disgrace upon us all. She's the first of the family that ever was a whore. On the following day, Tom hunts with Squire Western and accepts a dinner invitation at the squire's home. Present at dinner were Sophia and Parson Supple, who tells of the melee involving Molly and says that Molly was at the eve of bringing forth a bastard. Tom leaves without a word, and Sophia, seeing Tom's face, assumes that he is the father and vows to have nothing more to do with him. Tom continues to hunt with Sophia's father, and one day the squire convinces Sophia, who has not been speaking to Tom, to go along. Suddenly Sophia's horse rears, and Tom is able to catch Sophia before she falls, breaking his arm. A surgeon recommends that Tom stay at the westerns until recovered. During Tom's convalescence he has many visitors, most of whom lecture him on codes of virtue. 
However, his most welcome visitor is Sophia, who plays for him on her harpsichord. It becomes clear that Sophia and Tom love each other. Unfortunately, Squire Western is not interested in Tom as a son-in-law because he has no inheritance. And there is the matter of Molly, which is cleared up when Tom discovers that others have had affairs with her and that he is probably not the father of her child. Tom feels that he can now tell Sophia he loves her. Soon thereafter, Squire Allworthy becomes seriously ill. Thinking he might die, he calls the family to his bedside and explains the provisions of his will. Young Blifil will get the bulk of the estate. Tom is to receive one thousand pounds outright and an annual income of five hundred pounds, a tidy sum when you consider that many people lived on less than fifty pounds a year at that time. Blifil, who has left the sick room, suddenly returns with the news that his mother Bridget has died, even though he has been warned by the doctor that such news might hasten his uncle's death. Tom is outraged by Blifil's insensitivity. But fortunately, Squire Allworthy begins to feel better. Tom is so happy he drinks too much at dinner and gets into another argument with Blifil. To avoid the fight, Tom, half drunk, takes a walk. He is sitting under a tree when Molly comes upon him. Weakened by the drink, Tom is easily lured by Molly into a nearby grove. Unfortunately for Tom, Blifil and Thwackham also pick this time to take a walk. Blifil sees Tom and a woman, he doesn't know it's Molly, go into the bushes. When Blifil and Thwackham follow Tom, he strikes Blifil and a battle begins with Tom outmanned. At that moment, Sophia, her father, Squire Western, her aunt and Parson Supple stop by. Inquiring as to the cause of the quarrel, Squire Western discovers Molly, and Tom's credibility with Sophia is destroyed again. It is soon afterward that Sophia's aunt decides Sophia is in love, not with Tom, but with Blifil, who is Allworthy's heir. Seeing the monetary advantages of such a marriage, Squire Western decides to go along with his sister's plan. When Sophia finds out what is happening, she rebels, and when Squire Western realizes she loves Tom and not Blifil, he explodes. He tells Allworthy about all of Tom's misdeeds, including his adventure with Molly. Allworthy banishes Tom from his household and gives him what amounts to a money order for five hundred pounds. After walking a short distance, Tom goes temporarily mad, and during his brief tantrum, he accidentally throws away his money order. After calming down and walking a distance, he decides he must write a farewell note to Sophia. He reaches into his pocket and discovers that his money is gone. On his way to find it, he runs into Black George, who helps him search for the paper, even though he had already pocketed it. George, despite all Tom has done for him, has no intention of giving such a large sum back. He does, however, agree to take a note to Sophia. At the time, Sophia is locked in her room because of her refusal to wed Blifil. But Black George gets Tom's note to Sophia with the help of her servant, Honor. Sophia feels sorry for Tom and sends sixteen guineas, all she has, with Black George for Tom's use. George thinks about keeping the money for himself, but turns it over to Tom. Later, Tom receives a letter from Squire Allworthy requesting that he leave the area. He heads for Bristol. Meanwhile, Sophia's father and aunt, both consumed by greed, violently demand that she marry Blifil. Finally, Squire Western frightens Sophia into agreeing. He is so pleased, he gives Sophia a hundred pounds to do with as she pleases. At this point, the book turns to Tom's journeys. While Tom is visiting an inn, he meets a group of soldiers and decides to join their ranks. Tom, who looks and acts like a gentleman, is asked to dine with the officers. During the evening, Tom calls for a toast to Sophia. But one of the officers, a fellow named Northerton, says in jest that he knows Sophie Western and that she is a tramp. Tom protests, and Northerton responds by throwing a bottle at Tom, hitting him in the head and knocking him out. Northerton is locked up but escapes during the night. Tom, who must stay behind to heal his wounds, does not join the army. Tom's next adventure involves Mr. Partridge, the unfairly banished schoolmaster. Mr. Partridge, who is working as a barber, meets Tom, and after assuring Tom he is not his father, agrees to travel with him as a servant, even though Tom has little money. Tom tells Partridge that he has been disinherited by Squire Allworthy, but Partridge doesn't believe it. He thinks if he helps Tom, he'll somehow be reinstated to his schoolmaster post. During their journeys, they come across a woman, stripped half-naked, struggling with a man who is preparing to hang her from a tree with her garter. Tom knocks the villain down with his stick and discovers that it is none other than Northerton, the soldier who had hit him in the head with the bottle in the inn. 
After tying Northerton up, he returns to the woman and plans to escort her to the nearby town of Upton. When Tom goes back to check on Northerton, he finds that Northerton has escaped. The woman, stripped to the waist, refuses Tom's coat. Tom walks ahead of her so as not to look at her naked body, which is well endowed. When they arrive at the inn in Upton, the landlady thinks that the woman is a whore and tries to send her away. A fight erupts involving Tom, the naked woman, the landlord, Susan the maid, and Partridge, who arrives late but still gets into it. This is the first of many bizarre events at the inn. Next, an unidentified lady and her maid arrive and go directly to their rooms. Then a group of soldiers arrive and recognize the woman Tom saved as Captain Waters' lady. When the landlady hears that the woman is a lady, she tries to make amends by offering a gown. Soon thereafter, Tom and Mrs. Waters slip off to her room where she seduces him. Meanwhile, the soldiers tell Partridge that there are questions as to whether Mrs. Waters is actually married and suggest that she has been having an affair with Northerton. It is learned that Mrs. Waters had run away with Northerton, who had decided to kill her for her possessions, which included a diamond ring. Fortunately, Tom had saved her. Next, a man named Fitzpatrick comes to the inn, frantically looking for his wife, who has left him. Thinking that Mrs. Waters might be her, a servant directs him to her room. He breaks in and finds Tom, who assures him the woman in bed, who Fitzpatrick can't see clearly, is not his wife. Fortunately, a friend convinces Fitzpatrick of that fact, and he calms down. Tom is also able to convince the landlady that he has gone to the room to defend Mrs. Waters against robbers. She believes Tom, mostly because Partridge has convinced her that Tom is Squire Allworthy's heir. Of course, Mrs. Fitzpatrick and her maid are in another room at the inn. Meanwhile, Sophia and her maid, Honor, who have been following Tom since escaping from Sophia's father, arrive at the inn. Honor overhears that Tom is at the inn and tells Sophia, who asks her to get a note to him. But Honor is so abrasive that no one will help. Finally, she goads Partridge into telling her that Tom is with a winch. The vicious Honor gives Sophia the news and reminds her of Tom's affair with Molly Seagrim. At first, Sophia doesn't want to believe the story, but a chambermaid confirms it. With her, she has a muff that Tom once kissed when he was recovering at her home from his broken arm. She believed it was a symbol of his love for her, so she bribes a servant to put it in Tom's bed as an accusation. The next morning, Tom discovers the muff, goes wild, and orders Partridge to hire horses to find Sophia, who had left the inn earlier. Meanwhile, Fitzpatrick is about to depart toward Bath when he gets information that Mrs. Fitzpatrick might still be at the inn. After what is described as a riotous scene in which he knocks on door after door, Mr. Fitzpatrick finally realizes that his wife is gone. Just then, Squire Western, frantically in pursuit of Sophia, arrives at the inn. Had he been two hours earlier, he would not only have found Sophia, but his niece Harriet, who just happened to be Fitzpatrick's wife. Both Fitzpatrick and Western run madly around in search of their wife and daughter, respectively. When they enter the kitchen, Tom is seen holding Sophia's muff. When Western spots Tom, he cries, We've got the dog, Fox. I warrant the bitch is not far off. Once Fitzpatrick realizes that Western is his rich uncle, he tries to impress him by calling Tom a liar for claiming he didn't know where Sophia had gone. Then, thinking that Mrs. Waters must be Sophia, he leads Western to her room, saying that he had seen Sophia and Tom together. When they break in, they find Mrs. Waters, not Sophia. Finally, Tom and Partridge take to the road, and Western and his attendants continue their search for Sophia. Mrs. Waters goes with Fitzpatrick to console him in the absence of his wife. After leaving the inn, Sophia is caught up with by Harriet, her cousin and Fitzpatrick's runaway wife. Since the two girls were friends since childhood, they decide to travel together. Harriet tells the story of her troubled marriage, and Sophia gives an account of her life, but because of her anger for Tom, she doesn't mention him once. With the help of an Irishman, a friend of Harriet's who befriends them at an inn after Sophia loses the money her father had given her, the two women arrive in London. Harriet, showing her true character, shocks Sophia by saying she is meeting the Irishman in Bath. Sophia plans to stay with a Lady Belliston, who had treated her with kindness many years earlier. Meanwhile, Western loses interest in chasing Sophia and is persuaded to return home and Tom and Partridge, who are walking, come upon a beggar, who offers to sell them a pocketbook he has found. The pocketbook contains Sophia's name and the one hundred pounds her father had given her. Tom vows to go to London to return the money. 
Along the way, he meets people who have seen Sophia. Tom forgets about any intentions he might have had to rejoin the army. This relieves Partridge greatly, as he has no interest in battles. Throughout the last portion of the story, which takes place mostly in London, Tom continually does good deeds. His first such deed is the release of a highwayman who has attempted to rob Partridge and him. When the man says he has a wife and six children to feed, he is released. When Tom reaches London, he begins a frustrating search for Sophia. It seems no one will help him to find her. Harriet, when she meets Tom, thinks he is Blithville, from whom she knows Sophia is hiding. Harriet, of course, has never heard of Jones because Sophia hasn't mentioned him. Harriet also hopes to gain from the situation. She thinks that if she can return Sophia to her father and Harriet's uncle, Squire Western, she will be rewarded. However, when Harriet asks Lady Belliston, at whose home Sophia is living, to help her, the lady refuses because she has been told by Mrs. Western that the squire is a brute. However, she does agree to keep Sophia from Tom. Harriet is now with the Irishman, who out of jealousy forbids her to see Tom again. Meanwhile, Tom and Partridge are living with the widow and her two daughters, Nancy, seventeen, and Betty, ten, whose squire Allworthy has supported since the death of the widow's husband. One night, Tom hears a female voice scream for help in another part of the house, and he comes to the rescue. He fights off a servant and is thanked by a young gentleman and a young lady, who turns out to be Nancy, the landlady's daughter. The man's name is Nightingale. While Mrs. Miller, the landlady, Tom, and Nightingale are having breakfast in the morning, a package comes to the house for Tom. It contains a ticket to a masquerade party, a popular form of entertainment for London society at the time. Thinking the ticket came from Harriet, Tom decides to attend. But at the party, he discovers that it is Lady Belliston who is interested in him. He is invited to follow her to a well-finished house where he stays the night, starting what is easily his most offensive affair. Tom not only experiences a night of pleasure, he comes home with fifty pounds for his efforts. Mrs. Miller is late for dinner the next evening and explains that she has been helping some poor relatives, the Andersons. Hearing the sad story, Tom immediately offers to give them the fifty pounds, but she will not take more than a fifth of the total. Because his affair with Lady Belliston is conducted at the home of one of the lady's friends, Tom doesn't realize that Sophia is staying at Mrs. Belliston's home. When this arrangement is no longer possible, Lady Belliston decides to invite Tom to her home while Sophia, Honor, and her personal maid, Mrs. Etoff, attend a play. As Tom is about to visit Lady Belliston, he is called by Mrs. Miller, who introduces him to the Andersons, her poor relatives he has helped. Mr. Anderson turns out to be the highwayman who had attempted to rob Tom. Tom acts as if they have never met and accepts his thanks. At Lady Belliston's, Tom is waiting for the lady in a drawing room when Sophia suddenly bursts in. It seems that a riot had broken out at the theater, and Sophia and her companions have come home for their safety. Tom pretends he has come to Lady Belliston's to return Sophia's lost pocketbook, Sophia pretends she does not know Tom. Lady Belliston pretends that she believes Tom and Sophia do not know each other. On his way out, Tom gives Sophia's maid honor his address so that Sophia will know where to find him. Lady Belliston realizes the affection Tom has for Sophia and is angry and jealous. She visits Tom's home until Mrs. Miller complains that these visits are damaging the reputation of her and her daughter. She knows Allworthy has banished Tom and mentions that Tom's behavior must be why. Since Tom can convince her his meetings with Lady Belliston are honorable, he agrees to move elsewhere. After Mrs. Miller leaves, Nightingale enters. He says that he and Nancy Miller are lovers, but that his father has planned for him a marriage with an heiress. Because of this, Nightingale also wants to leave the Miller household. Fielding continually illustrates the folly of arranged marriages and champions the values of true love over parental greed. The situation gets worse when it is revealed that Nancy is pregnant. Nightingale wants to marry her, but is penniless without his father's inheritance. Tom, again displaying his desire to help others, tries to reason with Nightingale's father and uncle, but fails. Nightingale, however, chooses love and honor over money and marries Nancy anyway. Lady Belliston, meanwhile, is so jealous of Sophia that she devises a plan to get her out of the way. She encourages a young nobleman named Lord Felimar to pursue Sophia and to assure his success by raping her. Felimar, impressed by the riches of Sophia's family, agrees to attack her. Just when he begins the attack, however, Squire Western and his party burst into the room. 
Western, who is drunk, is unaware of what is happening and yells at his daughter. Western now takes Sophia away from Lady Bellaston's and fires on her for helping Sophia escape from him in the first place. Later we learn that Harriet Fitzpatrick told Western of Sophia's whereabouts, hoping to gain his good graces. Following Nancy and Nightingale's wedding, Tom receives three letters from Lady Bellaston. He decides to break off the relationship. Nightingale tells him that the best way is to propose marriage, because a former lover had done so and was immediately dismissed by Lady Bellaston. The strategy works and the affair is ended, but not Lady Bellaston's bitterness. Since Sophia is still angry at Tom and completely under the control of her father, Tom makes little headway finding her. And soon the subject of marrying Blithill comes up again. Her father locks her in her room and swears to keep her there until she obeys him. Not long afterward, Lord Thelomar, through an agent, transmits a firm proposal of marriage. Squire Western, a country person not schooled in the ways of English society, rejects the offer, and he acts so uncivilized that the agent leaves convinced that the Westerns are far beneath he and Felomar's position in life and unworthy of such a marriage. During this time, Tom finally gets a letter through to Sophia, thanks to Black George, who was with Western's party. He gets a letter back returning the one hundred pounds he had returned to her and saying that she would not write him again. He is urged not to write her. Soon afterward, Sophia's aunt, Mrs. Western, decides that her brother can't handle Sophia and takes control of her niece. By this time, Blithill has learned of Sophia's whereabouts. He convinces Allworthy to go to London with him. When he gets there, he suspects that Mrs. Western no longer favors his union with Sophia. It seems that Lord Felomar has decided that he is in love with Sophia. Mrs. Western warns Felomar that Tom Jones, not Blithill, is the real threat, and suggests that Felomar have someone kidnap Tom and send him to sea. About this time, Harriet Fitzpatrick, who has been rejected totally by both the Westerns, contacts Tom and says she has something important to tell him. She suggests that Tom might get access to Sophia by pretending to woo her aunt. Tom rejects the idea and leaves the house. At that moment, Fitzpatrick, who has just learned of his wife's whereabouts, is nearing the home. Seeing Tom, his jealousy causes him to force Tom into a duel. Fitzpatrick stuns Tom by landing the first blow, but Tom quickly responds. Writes Fielding, Though he understood nothing of fencing, Tom pressed on so boldly upon Fitzpatrick that he beat down his guard and sheathed one half of his sword in the body of the said gentleman, who no sooner received it than he stepped backwards, dropped the point of his sword, and leaning upon it cried, I have satisfaction enough. I am a dead man. I hope not, cried Jones, but whatever be the consequence, you must be sensible you have drawn it upon yourself. Witnesses immediately grab Tom and take him before a magistrate. He is sent to prison to await trial, since everyone seems sure that Fitzpatrick will die from the wound. Soon after Tom's arrest, Allworthy and Blithill visit Mrs. Miller in Fitzpatrick's London home. When Blithill tells Allworthy that Tom has turned into a villain, Mrs. Miller defends him strongly. By all that's sacred, tis false, cries Mrs. Miller. Mr. Jones is no villain. He is one of the worthiest creatures breathing, and if any other person had called him a villain, I would have thrown all this boiling water in his face. Allworthy finds it hard to believe that Mrs. Miller is talking about the Tom Jones he knows, partly because Blithill has been poisoning his mind. But Mrs. Miller tells Allworthy how she knows Jones, then persists in her praise. You are deceived, sir, she says. If they were the last words which were to issue from my lips, I would say you were deceived. And I once more repeat it. The Lord forgive those who have deceived you. I am not prepared to say the young man is without faults, but they are all the faults of wildness and youth. They are vastly overbalanced by one of the most humane, tender, honest hearts that ever a man was blessed with. Meanwhile, Mrs. Western is working feverishly to make Sophia's marriage to Lord Felomar. And even after Sophia tells her Felomar tried to rape her, she doesn't alter her plans. In prison, Tom is depressed because he abhors violence, because he thinks he has killed Fitzpatrick, and because of the tone of his last letter from Sophia. Mrs. Miller, Partridge, and Nightingale visit the prison and try to cheer him up. Partridge tells him Fitzpatrick is still alive, and he perks up some when Mrs. Miller agrees to take a letter to Sophia. Sophia reads the letter, which she finds confusing because Tom wrote it in a state of depression. After Sophia totally rejects another attempt by Felomar to marry her, the scene shifts back to Tom in prison, where Tom has a surprise visitor, Mrs. Waters. She has been living with Fitzpatrick since meeting him at Upton. 
She assures Tom that Fitzpatrick is not likely to die, and that he has acknowledged before witnesses that he started the fight. Upon hearing this news, Tom pledges to lead an exemplary life from then on, which disappoints Mrs. Waters, who would secretly hope to rekindle her affair with Tom. Meanwhile, Partridge sees Mrs. Waters and realizes she is the former Jenny Jones, the confessed mother of Tom. In horror, he believes that Tom has been guilty of incest. Black George now brings word that Sophia has returned to her father Squire Western's residence, but is being allowed liberty because her father believes that she is going to comply with his wish to marry Blithill. Still in London, Allworthy, an old acquaintance of Nightingale's father, agrees to help Mrs. Miller resolve the differences created between the Nightingales over the marriage to her daughter. In talking with the elder Nightingale, he finds that Black George has asked Nightingale to invest some money for him, which on examination proves to be the same money that Allworthy gave Tom Jones when he banished him. He tells Nightingale to keep quiet about this issue for now. Allworthy is now starting to change his attitude toward Tom, helped by Mrs. Miller's prodding. And when he receives a letter from Square, a member of the clergy who once lived in the Allworthy household, extolling Tom's virtues, he is further impressed. At this point, Allworthy begins to check into Tom's past. He calls Partridge and asks him why he so vehemently denies that he is Tom's father when the case against him was so plain. Partridge says he wishes Allworthy was as wrong about the identity of Tom's mother as he was about his father. Just after horrifying Allworthy by saying that Tom had had an affair with his mother, Mrs. Waters suddenly appears in the room. Speaking to Allworthy privately, Mrs. Waters tells the whole story. You remember, sir, a young fellow whose name is Summer. Very well, cries Allworthy. Mrs. Waters goes on to say that Summer, who died of smallpox a year after he had lived in the Allworthy house, is Tom Jones's father, and that Allworthy's sister Bridget is his mother. Your sister was the mother of that child you found between your sheets. Be patient, sir, and I will unfold to you the whole story. Mrs. Waters then tells Allworthy that she was sworn to secrecy by his sister Bridget, who was sent away Mrs. Wilkins, and employed Jenny and her mother to take care of her during her pregnancy. Bridget intended to tell Allworthy, but never did. Meanwhile, Blithill has been doing all he can to see that Tom is convicted of the attack on Fitzpatrick. He has hired a lawyer named Dowling, who thinks he has actually been hired by Allworthy. During her conversation with Allworthy, Mrs. Waters asks why he is trying to have Tom convicted, and Allworthy replies that he has had nothing to do with it. At that moment, Dowling enters the room. He says that he believed he was acting under Allworthy's instructions. Then he confirms that Bridget was indeed Tom's mother. Bridget had given a letter to him for Allworthy, which he had given to Blithill. Blithill, however, had not given the letter to Allworthy, hoping it would mean a greater inheritance for him. Allworthy immediately goes to Squire Western's home, tells the squire that Tom is his legal heir, and apologizes for Blithill's deeds. He also praises Tom. Western says he has always liked Tom and opposed his marriage to Sophia out of greed. However, Sophia is at that moment vehemently opposed to marrying Tom and rejects him as strongly as she had Blithill. Tom is finally released from prison and begins his attempts to win Sophia. Over a period of time, Tom gradually wins her affection. Finally, she forgives Tom for all his misadventures, and they are married, have two children, and live in Squire Western's estate. He is moved to another estate where the hunting is supposedly better. Despite what Blithill has done to him, Tom continues his good works by making sure that Blithill receives a living. He also forgives Black George for keeping his money and makes sure that the Seagrim family, especially Molly, is taken care of. By then, George has disappeared, fearing he would be prosecuted for keeping Tom's money. Partridge is given a school and a salary by Allworthy and eventually marries Molly Seagrim. In summary, although Tom Jones is full of Fielding's social and religious commentary, it may be the first novel written designed to entertain the reader. He captures every phase of 18th century English life and all classes of people, and Fielding adds his own unbelievable coincidences to the plot to make it more entertaining. Although Tom has fallen from grace several times, his overall goodness makes him a hero to the reader. Fielding does not subscribe to the strict religious theory of the time that one sin taints a person forever. Rather, he believes that everyone has human failings and should be forgiven when they display human goodness. 
Fielding's vivid tale of sex, treachery, deceit, honor, and dishonor is indeed the forerunner of modern novels, even modern soap operas. A remake of the movie Tom Jones Today would no doubt be a big hit, particularly when you consider the visual expression allowed in movies today. Tom Jones is truly a great story which will enthrall and entertain readers for centuries to come. This is the end of the session.